Looks like central banks will continue hiking rates amid banking turmoil. The Bank of England today continues with interest rate hikes. The central bank raised interest rates by a quarter percentage point. This comes on the heels of hikes by the Federal Reserve and the Swiss National Bank. The Bank of England said in a statement that inflation has surprised significantly on the upside. UK consumer prices surged by 10.4 percent in February compared to a year ago. Relentless rate hikes are among factors for the worst banking sector stress since the 2008 financial crisis. The BOE acknowledges the volatility in financial markets but says Britain's banking system is resilient. Joining me now is Francis Hunt or the market sniper. You can check out his YouTube channel. He has a lot of views there. Now, I want to ask you first, uh, Francis, because we had the Fed uh, speech yesterday from Jay Powell. How many more rate hikes uh, do you see coming? Let's start from there. A good question. Uh, quite a bit of speculation. Uh, this, the tone of the Fed was more as per data, where previously they'd committed to a tightening cycle, which was meaning a series of ongoing tightening. It now seems more data dependent. So I think the recent events regarding the banks that ran into trouble, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature, etc., it seems that they're backing off, uh, over committing to too much uh, and saying we'll be more sensitive to whatever new data is coming in and that'll be a determinant. So undershoots on inflation or PPI even could see them potentially even be at the top. Um, so we'll have to watch that. A big point I'll make additional to that is that there was a large amount of central bank cooperation. So if the Fed were to fail to increase any further, and this is the top of the tightening cycle, you're likely to see a lot of similarity with the other major central banks. So there's quite a bit of coordination. I, I call it the, the leper colony of lepers in terms of the financial system where they all seem to have the same disease. We were expecting, the market was expecting 50 basis points before the banking crisis. Now we got 25 basis points. His reason, Powell's reason was that sort of credit conditions may get tighter because of uh, recent uh, the banking troubles. Do you think that is the case or is he worried about the banking sector? Which one do you think is the more likely reason? I think you're going to get a bit of both. First of all, it's getting it's harder and harder to get debt. We're seeing people, particularly in the car loan space, for example, there's a bit of a subprime cars things. I'm seeing big brands, solid brands in vehicles that are uh, discounting on new vehicles. So I think the, the banks will feel less confident in terms of the asset values and have, potentially having to, to repossess that. So I think credit is going to be harder to find. You've had six months of negative growth on housing. So in terms of valuations, you're going to see far more conservatism, underwriting uh, conservatism. So there's that. I think credit is going to be harder to get to. So we're going to see an asset price disinflation. That's a reduction um, broadly in valuation. And then I'm also of the view that they had to raise because if they had not raised a little bit, people would have seen that as a major admittance that there's a deep-seated crisis. So they have to show a bit of false bravado of confidence, but not excessively so. So that's why we ended up with the 25 basis points. 50 basis points would have been riding rough shot over the markets uh, and would have had a most adverse reaction, I, I, I expect, to the fragility that is truly there. But the Fed will always understate that Fed, and their job is to be a calming voice in times of fear. So I think there's a little bit of uh, deeper concern going on behind the scenes if you're leaving that one to me. I think a number of outlets actually detected a, a shift in tone uh, from Powell. I think some reported that uh, maybe he's indicating a pause, whereas before he he was saying uh, more more uh, higher rates and for longer. He was saying that during the hearing uh, recently. Uh, but on, on another topic, uh, I was uh, watching some of your videos, you mentioned the word hyperstagflation. Now, are we in this environment right now or do you see one coming? Maybe just talk a little bit on that point. Sure. What do I mean by hyperstagflation? Well, stagflation is an environment where prices don't really go down, even in this disinflationary uh, potential that we might be stepping off the cliff into right now. Uh, they go somewhat, but then they're very quick to rebound and make new highs in an environment that's coinciding with 
very low growth, even negative growth, that continues to be bad. It, I, re I refer to it almost if for people who wish to understand the, the concept of hyperstagflation as the inverse Goldilocks economy that was the bequest of Alan Greenspan, where you had stubbornly low inflation and they kept complaining they couldn't get inflation. They ran much lower interest rates than they should and we got all this asset price inflation. So there was actually inflation, but not so much in everyday consumables. You were getting it in the US stock market. You were getting it in the housing market that, have, that led up to the 2007 highs there. So the inverse of the Goldilocks economy is actually quite a, a long day and a long summer is leading to a, a, a long night or a, a long cold winter. And unfortunately, in the world of yin and yang, uh, if you uh, if you over binge uh, during the party season, you you detox for a lot longer. And I, and I fear that is the dark side of the moon that we have to walk right now. And the, hence the hyper stagflation, stubborn growth, difficult to get work. Um, for new job starters, housing prices down. We've called the turn in the debt market. Uh, and uh, I think US stocks particularly, but stocks generally got to come off. Uh, gold is one of the few highlights apart from the military industrial complex, which is another discussion entirely in equities, gold, and some will even point to Bitcoin uh, in terms of the anti-fiats. So it's less a dollar story against other currencies, although we did get a bit of dollar weakness uh, after the Fed. It's more the anti-fiats versus the debt banking and currency system. So that's the macro view to have. Instead of being cross-currency, think about what if I'm not participating in the bond, banking, and debt holy trinity uh, system, and I'm looking at these alternatives to wealth storage. Capital preservation is a key, key theme here. Should we be worried about a hyper -stag stagflation? Is that something on the horizon? I think we're already in the process of experiencing it, but it's kind of like having two simultaneous pains going on, an earache uh, and maybe, you know, uh, a broken foot. Uh, you get stabs of one and then the other, and they aren't always necessarily coincident coinciding uh, to, at the same moment. At the moment, we are looking at teetering into the disinflation, which is going to be the, that particular stagflation is going to be on the growth side. So there's going to be low growth, negative growth potential, uh, low jobs and asset uh, value declining. So there's going to be a, a very low wealth effect, a negative wealth effect. So that's the pain that's about to hit, I feel, right now. But even though that's happening, that often leads to lower prices, but that's good. we're going to get a much lesser dip and lesser relief. Uh, one of the things for healing these things is lower prices. Then you start to get growth again. But I feel that we, we, we don't get that same commiserate downside in prices. So you you the, that's the stagflationary part, which was led into the inflation cycle that took us to this precipice uh, so far. So you're going to be caught between these two pains. Uh, and that's the hyper stagflation and I think we're there already is there is what do you see is the way out of this uh, talk a little bit about that so in terms of the existing system, I don't honestly believe there is a solution uh, at all. Uh, in fact, if these were these two walls, one's electrocuting you and another stabbing you, you're in a tapering environment where you're getting more of both. Uh, the alternative is the new solution, uh, which will probably end up jubileeing out a lot of debt, leaving an old system, closing a door, having a major problem reaction solution environment where a new technology is launched that's where all the talk about cbdc's and ubi's you know pension systems go bust if the debt system fails so what are you going to implement that replaces that so this does point to financial reset there's no amazing central banking policies that engineer you out of this we're too far gone in my take wow uh, let me ask you uh, an investment question now. A lot of people saying that right now it's not a good time to be looking at upside opportunities. Do you agree with that or maybe explain? 
um, it depends if you're how broad you are a macro view in terms of gold i'll highlight that gold's made new highs against the australian dollar new highs against the british pound new highs against the japanese yen across an absolute smorgasbord of emerging markets like the rand uh, the indian rupee uh, you know the, the the major bricks so gold investment is definitely capital preservation and i've referred to it before as the golden arc that will transition you from the rickety old train that's going to die on its warped railway lines to the new monorail. And that is the best, uh, one of the best. And the, the digital age and the younger generation will also be talking about um, the limited, the 21 million restriction on Bitcoin as at least representing something that is not being proliferated. Uh, you have a fixed quantity and of course the halvening cycle is ever reduced amounts of new liquidity in that uh, so there's going to be a lot of popularity that's your upside with regards to something like equities the big spenders now is actually government we have, retail is crushed the consumer is crushed and i'm uh, i think more and more that realization is going to come through so we've seen the military industrial complex equities at close to highs and i think the european ones uh, are going to continue higher like ba uh, british um, aerospace uh, for one if you have a look at saab it's at near all-time highs uh, and i think that goes hand in hand with a lot of old stock potentially being moved into the proxy war that nato seems to be uh, leading against uh, russia uh, via the ukraine so in this environment, I know you talked a, a little bit of, about this uh, on your YouTube channel. Uh, you talked about oil, right? Uh, do you, where do you see oil going? So energies is such a tell. That's such a good question, and thank you for it. Um, energies is such a tell. Natural gas had a very clear head and shoulders that crashed in December, and it was a leading energy uh, component that fell. Highs at 10 trading sub three at 2.8s, 2.7s. That's a massive coming off. And don't forget, we were supposed to be getting the dark outs and the, and the blackouts uh, of Europe, potentially the UK, uh, because of the restrictions on buying Russian gas. Uh, so those were expected to see super high prices. And in effect, we've gone exactly the opposite way. And more recently, we're seeing structure on oil that actually points to a substantial correction. We have a 40% downside from the 75 range, we're now at about 65, 67 uh, dollars on Western Texas Intermediate. We could see a three in that number. So normally this is associated with reduced activity, reduced consumption, reduced freedom of movement when we've had lockdowns before, reduced flying, business, etc. So it's, it, it is a very good measure for business activity, packaging, delivery, purchases uh, in uh, oil. And it's similarly reflected actually in uranium, which is obviously driving nuclear energy. So across the energy complex, we're seeing downside. And that points to recessional uh, consumer uh, and retail behavior. So consumer and retail stocks, most of the risks are to the downside. Uh, and we would be biasing short in that space. Right, right. Uh, when, when we have an economic, economic downturn, uh, we have less demand for energy. So it, it makes sense that oil is going where you say it is. Uh, but I understand you're also a teacher. You've given a number of lectures a as well. Um, maybe on that point, what are some good tips uh, to be a successful trader? What discipline do you need? Um, first of all, you've got to earn the right to leverage. Uh, You've got to show that in life, it's about the disciplines you install upon yourself. The quality of your life is determined about the disciplines you install on yourself. So you've got to show an aptitude to actually slowly invest dollar cost averaging, choosing key categories and going slow. Leverage is a, a, a very powerful tool that cuts both ways. Uh, and it should be treated very judiciously uh, with tight money management. And that's a skill set that needs to be learned. And there's a dopamine effect by engaging markets where you get pleasant news and surprises. Some will re refer to it as the casino effect. You've got to avoid trading turning into gambling. Uh, so you've got to earn that right to leverage with solid 
foundation of investments. And I would say right now for your times, given what we're facing, we're in a transition actually. A 40 year bond cycle has ended. And actually during that period, you had a buy the dip meme that kept working on equities as well as bonds. Uh, and I feel that that page has turned uh, now. So what you actually want to be looking at, I think, are the categories I've highlighted, such as gold and Bitcoin, and showing that just monthly you live within your means, you have a little bit left over, and you make purchases in those areas where you're likely to get appreciation. Uh, and then in time, maybe if you don't mind holding your nose, you can look at the military industrial complex equities if you want to go into the equity market. But generally, particularly U.S. equities, but equities generally are going to have a difficult time, especially those on the consumer side. So it would be dangerous for someone new just to go straight into with leverage shorting retail consumer equities. And in fact, it would even be more dangerous if they were successful because they would get ahead of themselves and just set themselves up for a bigger fall. You need to learn money management. Hence why I say a bit of learning and a bit of education in the space is smart. But if you don't have the time, you're a worker, your job, you want to passively invest, dollar cost averaging into gold uh, and maybe Bitcoin, very, very good. In terms of other equity markets closer to home, we actually like the Singapore Straits Index as a general investment. And when you lose capital formation, or it is uh, moving away from the US and Europe, it will still reform somewhere else. And our uh, hotspot is uh, Singapore uh, globally, not just for the Southeast Asian uh, markets. We can see Indonesian companies. We can see it being the sanitized face of future Chinese equities for people that are reluctant to go all the way into China. Uh, we're very optimistic Singapore and an and a ETF on the general index could do you well too for early beginners. So you mentioned gold, uh, you mentioned uh, Bitcoin. What are some of your uh, favorite investments right now? Uh, initially it's gold, but we're seeing on uh, the gold silver ratios turning, silver's putting in a, a slightly more energetic performance at lag. So typically there's a firing order, a bit like opening the bonnet on a V12 uh, Ferrari. They tell you what order the cylinders fire. And when you start to get suspicion, in the soundness of money. Gold is an investment in bad economic principle. It's a preservation of capital investment, and it runs first. And because it's the big players, usually the smartest players is the big money, they start taking gold. Um, it's harder uh, for smaller people to afford sometimes gold, and silver is maybe the poor man's gold. But what you find after that is silver runs subsequently, but is higher beta and runs harder. So. You know, those things will start to occur and also the miners. So initially you've got to see the main commodity run and the metals miners and silver sit back a little bit and say, well, one swallow doesn't a summer make. Uh, let's see if it stays there. We've been promised this bull market for gold for a while. And what tends to happen, the longer it sustains and the further you suddenly have catch up and a re-rating on miners. Uh, which are pulling out both gold and silver uh, and silver itself. And then silver, once it gets on its horses super fast, there's a higher beta, typically about 2.5 uh, times. So once you get a 3% move in gold over a week, you can sometimes get 6 and 10% moves in silver. That is yet to happen, but I sense it's the next stage. So you could start positioning for a pivot from your gold investments to adding a little bit more of the riskier, higher beta miners and uh, silver, for example. Sure, sure. And one last thing, and I'd like to go to a previous point you made uh, about oil. Um, you, you said it indicates uh, a possible economic downturn. Um, is that your view? Do you believe a recession is coming? My view is recession is indeed coming. And that's a brave call to be making during a hot war going from uh, Russia, between Russia and Ukraine, to actually be a bear on oil. And I think what this means is, not only uh, is it a, a recession, it's quite a severe recession, because it is countervailing the fact that we actually have quite a significant conflict going on, which is a massive consumer of oil. So to be bearish into the face of that, there could of course be the possibility of a peace agreement, et cetera, et cetera, we don't know. Um, maybe that will also help and see a downside rating. But 
uh, yeah, the future is indicating uh, recession for me, and certainly possibly lack or reduced uh, movement. So that could be lockdowns enforced, or it could be just financially enforced. In other words, it's expensive for a business to, uh, to send uh, an executive uh, to fly first class, to go do a meeting, more Zoom calls, less travel, a more mild holiday season, people aren't going as far, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But that's all points to recession and reduced expenditure. All right, thank you, Francis. And once again, check out his channel, Market Sniper, if you have your time. Uh, pleasure talking to you today. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on.